Why, hello, welcome to the Theology Pugcast. It's great to have you with us. I'm C.R. Wiley, and I'm one of the pugs here on the podcast. I'm a pastor. I serve a church in the Pacific Northwest. I've been a professor of philosophy, and I've been a real estate investor, and I've even swung a hammer. I've got some background in the trades. That's enough about me. Uh, how about you, Tom? I'm another part of the grumble. <laughs> I'm Tom Price. <laughs> I teach systematic theology, Christian ethics, and philosophy. Uh, Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary is one of the places that I teach. All right. Well, today is Glenn's Day, and so folks who listen to the podcast on a regular basis know we share uh, the topics, uh, or each one of us pick the to- a topic for the day if we don't have like a, an interview uh, uh, with a guest. And today is Glenn's day. So Glenn, why don't you introduce yourself and just go ahead and take us right into the topic of the day. Yes, I'm Glenn Sunshine. I'm a professor emeritus of history at Central Connecticut State University, a senior fellow at the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, and a ministry associate at Reflections Ministries. Um, Today, I have written over the years a lot of articles dealing with holidays. And one of my favorite things to do is debunk nonsense in the popular imagination about holidays. And I've done that for Christmas. Uh, I actually did it for Halloween. Uh, we've done shows on both of those. Um, I did something on correcting sort of the revisionist narratives about Thanksgiving. But aside from short responses to nonsense on Facebook, I haven't done Easter yet. So (laughs) this week, I want to take a look at debunking a lot of the myths that even even Christians that I know uh, have about the origins of Easter and some of our Easter practices. Great. So that's that's what I thought we'd do. And then we'll see where you guys want to take it, because it can go in a lot of different directions. (laughs) Sounds good. Well, Easter is Easter, of course, is a like kind of the big holiday for Christians for obvious mm-hmm. reasons. And uh, it's kind of odd that some people kind of think we shouldn't, uh, you know, celebrate Easter. So maybe we can get into that in the show a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've got some stories on that one too. But <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll see if we get there. Let, let, let's start off though, just by um, depaganizing our notion of where Easter comes from and, and <laughs> some of our, the things we associate with Easter. Um, Probably the most common thing you'll hear on this, I think, is that Easter is has its origins in paganism because a guy named the Venerable Bede noted that uh, it, he, he did a piece on, on the reckoning of time in which he talked about calendars and where holidays fell and all of this kind of thing. And then he has one section of it where he says, In olden times, the English people, for it did not seem fitting to me that I should speak of other people's observance of the year and yet be silent about my own nations, calculated their months according to the course of the moon. And then he goes on from there, and he notes that, um, let's see, uh, where is it? In April, they called Eostermonat. And he notes that um, Eostermonat has a name that is now translated as Paschal Month, Easter Month, pa- mm-hmm. Paschal, right. and which was once called after a goddess of theirs named Eoster, mm-hmm. uh, in whose honor feasts were celebrated in that month. Now, people have taken that. E- Eoster is obviously looks like the root for Easter. Right. It, hint, it isn't. But... Um, <laughs> people have taken that to say that Easter is therefore a Christianization of a pagan holiday. Right. And it's named after a pagan goddess, therefore it's pagan, we shouldn't do it. Now, the number of things wrong with this line of reasoning is kind of legion. (laughs) Uh, Let's just start with a little bit of linguistics. It turns out that Easter is Easter in English, it's Austern in German, But in every other language that I've tracked down, including Norwegian, Swedish, Dutch, uh, French, Italian, Spanish, and so on, the root word for Easter comes from the Greek Pascha, which comes from the Hebrew Pesach, meaning Passover. Only in English and in German 
does the word derive from anything else? If that's the case, unless you are hopelessly Anglo-centric, <laughs> to argue that the holiday is pagan because of the name is kind of nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> now, now, as it turns out, th there's a lot of good reasons to assume that Easter doesn't come from Eoster, a pagan goddess. Right, okay? right. Or in German, Ostara, which is supposedly a goddess of spring as well. Yeah. Let's start with the fact that there is no, we have no source, no reference for Eoster except from the Venerable Bede. The only thing we think we know about this goddess comes from Bede. Right. Okay. So we'll start with that. The same thing goes for Ostara, by the way. It's also, there's really no information about that goddess around either, despite what pagans claim. I'll get to some of the pagan claims on that later. But so, before, before you jump in there, Glenn, it's, it's interesting how selective we can be with our fussiness regarding the provenance of words. So mm -hmm. if we look at the, just the week, every, every day of the week uh, that we you you know, the term we use for those days without even thinking uh, is based on a kind of, well, Ptolemaic cosmology for one thing, but also once you get past Sunday, which is obviously sun, and Monday, which is Monday, which is moon. Both then, of which were gods. Right. Yeah, all of them were gods. Yeah, the you're, you're, <laughs> yeah. Immediately you're into the you're you're into the Norse gods. Tyr, to, Wolfgang, yep. Thor, Frey, and then yep. back to Roman with Saturn. Yeah, Saturn. it's all yeah. mixed up. <laughs> so but <laughs> I've never I've never heard a person complain uh, about Tuesday. In other words, I've never heard a person say we we shouldn't use we shouldn't use that word Tuesday anymore because of its, you know, pagan provenance. More people complain about Monday than Tuesday. <laughs> are, are you saying because it's Monday and the, and the weekend's over? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Well, that, that's the reason. But yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Anyway, I I just I thought it was worthwhile injecting that there because people get really weird about you know it's, it's just like they get fixated on a particular thing and lose sight of a lot of other stuff that's just as much uh, a reflection of this of this dynamic. Yeah, January is named for a Roman god. Right. Yeah. You know, let let's let's be real here. Um, okay, so the, the other the other thing, I mean, aside from just the linguistic problem here, the other thing is that when you look at the early church, they fought really hard to depaganize their culture. Okay, they were utterly ruthless at trying to eliminate any vestige of paganism in their culture. Now, people will immediately say, well, Christmas was Saturnalia. No, it wasn't. Go listen <laughs> to that old show. Um, <laughs> but in, in light of the very well-documented evidence of this, is it likely that Christians would name the most holy day of the Christian year, their, mo their highest, most sacred feast day, after a pagan goddess? This strikes me as implausible in the extreme. <laughs> okay. So th that leaves us that leaves us with the question of why why Easter? Where did that name come from? Well, uh, this gets complicated. We got to play with a little Latin here. Mm -hmm. um, it turns out in the early church, uh, the practice was you you could not join the church except on Easter. So you, the normal practice would be you would spend a time studying. You'd be a catechumen. You'd be studying. And then when you completed your study and asked to join the church, you would go to the church on Easter Sunday and be baptized. And they would baptize you in white robes. So the Easter Sunday was called Domenica in Albis, which means... Sunday in white from the white robes that the bap newly baptized were wearing. Um, and actually the entire Easter season was actually known Easter week, the, the eight day period from Easter Sunday to the following Sunday was actually known as the week in white, the white, well, actually white week. Okay. Now it turns out that this phrase in Albus 
was, it seems, now this is the scholarly consensus here. This isn't just me coming up with this. It seems that in, in uh, Old High German, they had misunderstood in albus and thought it was the plural of alba, Latin for dawn. And so it was translated into Old High German as eostarum, which is the plural for dawn, of the dawn. And as a result, that became the root for Easter and Oster. Got it. So it's a kind of complicated thing involving a mistranslation of Latin into Old High German. Right. But that is why only English and German maintain this. It's because they both come from that root, and they didn't get corrected anywhere along the way. Yeah, I don't know if many people are familiar with that fact that English has a real debt to you know old German, um, mm. you know through the well, through the Saxons and so forth. Yeah, English is actually classified as a Germanic language. Right. It's got a yeah. huge amount of French yeah. in it, Norman French. Right. Um, but but English is actually, as a language, English is sort of like a linguistic mugger. It beats up <laughs> other languages and then goes through their pockets for spare words. <laughs> That's right. That's why we have such a, a large vocabulary. I, I do believe that English has the largest vocabulary of any uh, European language. Actually, probably of any language on the planet, because we yeah. just keep ripping off words that we find useful. Yeah, um, yeah. We, yeah. we appropriate, cultural appropriation. Hey, there cultural you go. Cultural appropriation. <laughs> you know, it, it's worth noting that um, I, I talked to a German scholar once, and he said that the difference between English and German grammatically is that when we want to, in English, when we want to have fine distinctions in meaning, we do it for ch by choosing different words. Uh, all the subtleties in English come from vocabulary. Right. In German, they do it with grammar. Okay. Which is why German grammar can be kind of a nightmare for non-Germans, yeah. yeah. especially <laughs> academic prose. It's, it's, yeah, it, <laughs> yeah. it's, well, yeah, enough said. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so uh, the English language is, has, has its complications. And one of them is this misunderstanding of where Easter, the word Easter comes from. Right. Okay. Now, Occasionally, and I'll come back to this later, uh, occasionally you will find people saying that Easter is a pagan holiday because it comes from the ancient Sumerian, the name comes from the ancient Sumerian goddess Ishtar. Mm -hmm. I hope we've already disposed of that one. Right. <laughs> but interestingly enough, if you even go to a website like Christianity.com, they take the myth of Ishtar and her husband Tammuz and say that this may be one of the sources for Christian ideas about Easter. <laughs> How you get this on Christianity.com, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, but in any event, uh, that we'll, we'll come back to that myth later. Um, well, what, what I'd like but to the do, dying and rising God thing is what comes in on this one. Yeah, I guess, I guess the thing that I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, Glenn, related to this matter is, why is it uh, that I think good-hearted people well-intentioned people uh, get so exercised about this kind of stuff and so committed to uh, a way of thinking about, well, not just Easter, but Christmas. And we could talk about some other things as well uh, without uh, actually doing the, the really hard work of discovering whether or not their, their convictions are actually based in, in facts or not. What do you think it is? I've got some, I've got my theories, but uh, do you have any thoughts? Well, uh, my best guess is that, well, first of all, the pagans out there love to do this kind of thing. Sure. You know, they, you know, even, you know, you'll, you'll see Norse pagans wearing the little Thor's hammer around their neck. Yeah, yeah. That practice was actually done by ancient Vikings, but only after those ancient Vikings had a lot of interactions with Christians who were wearing a cross. Yeah, yeah. So but the I, Thor's hammer around the neck is actually done in imitation of Christians wearing a cross. I mean, yeah, I, 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 they, they, I, so I, it's I cultural appropriation in the opposite direction. <laughs> I, I get the pagans. What I'm concerned about is sort of like the 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 Christians, particularly those who are the sort of the most antagonistic toward the institutional church. If you know what I mean, you know, home church types, th those folks. They seem to be 
uh, more than happy to just imbibe any kind of, of uh, idea, sort of embrace any sort of idea that will sort of debunk or, or cast some, I guess, uh, doubt upon the legitimacy of something that Christians have done for a long time. Right. I, and I was going to get to them. I wanted to start yeah. with the pagans because we sure. have to at least think our hat there. Because a lot of these ideas actually come. Oh, yeah, I was yeah, just going to throw, throw a real quick point in there is that, yeah, similarly, I think, and I think you're going to get to this, but similarly, you have this this kind of trend that kind of the spiritual rather than the invisible, I mean, the visible church, right? The invisible church, um, it, for, for all of their, you know, disliking of Plato, you know, Plato's influence, you do see this kind of, um, this disposition that anything, the visible church that is historical, that is incarnated, that is sent, you know, uses the liturgy of the senses, um, has to be something this worldly, and therefore, the purer you can get with no, you know, the mo- the least amount of holidays and associations, the closer you are to the the real deal. Anyway, I wanted to throw it out before I I, I kind of escaped me. <laughs> yeah, that, I I think that Gnostic, which is what we're really talking about here, that Gnostic tendency, I think, is alive and well, particularly in a lot of uh, fundamentalism. Yeah, in the strict sense of the word here. Um, I would add to that, what goes right along with that is a rejection of history. There's the idea that that, uh, we are the people who have rediscovered the gospel. Because if, in fact, you argue that the Holy Spirit has been active in the church throughout history, you've got to talk about how what you're doing fits in with what they were doing, and you've got to do a lot of hard work. It's much simpler to, to take the me and Jesus, we've discovered the gospel. The church lost it all of these years. This is why we can't be Catholic. It's why we can't. I mean, I run into Baptists who swear they're not Protestants. Baptists aren't Protestant. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's why we want to disconnect from the past because otherwise we have to actually deal with the arguments there. And we think we've got it all just by reading the Bible. You know, now the, there's the, a laudable the, side to this. They want to have a they want to have a pure Christianity. But their concept of what that means is rather minimalistic. You know, this, there's a weird parallel to wokeism here. So we just yep. had, you know, we, we just had Mark, Mark Bauerlein on to talk about, you know, one of his uh, new books. Um, and uh, that will probably actually be the week after this episode when it will air. So yeah. if no, Bugsters, if you're looking for that episode, <laughs> wait. <laughs> right. But but isn't it but it, isn't it interesting that this is something that woke people and mm-hmm. some of these let's get back to the sort of to the pure New Testament church people have in common. They hate history. They hate the mm-hmm. messiness of history. They don't want to have to do the hard work of sorting out the wheat from the chaff when it comes to, okay, yeah, there were a lot of, uh, there was a lot that you could criticize about the medieval church, but if it wasn't, uh, if that middle, if that church did not exist, we wouldn't have our Bibles. In other words, they were the <laughs> conduit and, you know, with all of their, all of their faults and foibles, they were the conduit through, through which, uh, you know, we've received the scriptures. This is something You know, I I think that many of these people really do think that it just kind of falls out of the sky. Like I remember Mm -hmm. one time, uh, you know, I asked I asked a question of some uh, a Sunday school class. Where do we get our Bibles? And this woman responded from the store. (laughs) That that was as far (laughs) as it went. I was like, well, I mean, where did the store get it? (laughs) You know, publisher. (laughs) <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah, but but you see what I'm getting at is is that is that we have the same phenomenon today with the woke because George Washington had slaves. There's nothing that George Washington did that's worthwhile because Thomas Jefferson owned slaves. Nothing that Thomas Jefferson said uh, is worth reading. This is nonsense. And and many of these people who want to get rid of the entire history of Christianity right up to the second chapter of Acts, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, you know, they, they're, they're doing the same thing that woke people are doing. They're canceling, they're, they're, they're taking down statues. They're doing all, they're doing the very same stuff. Anyway, something mm-hmm. to, for our, our, our pugsters to kind of reflect on a little bit. Yeah. Now, uh, I, like I said, I want to come back to the Ishtar and Tammuz legend later or myth later um, in connection with C.S. Lewis. 
But before we get there, I want to just deal with a couple of other things really quickly. Um, when your average person out on the street, not in a church, thinks about Easter, what comes to mind? The Easter bunny, of course. The Easter bunny and? Eggs. Can candy. Easter eggs. <laughs> eggs. Yeah. <laughs> which, with candy yeah, for me. Preferably chocolate <laughs> eggs, right? <laughs> which, which, which we which we all know are fertility symbols. So this shows that <laughs> Easter is just a warmed over fertility uh, festival, right? Uh, wrong. It turns by, out, by the I way, actually by, did the research on this. It turns out that that's not where these things come from. <laughs> by the way, I, I'm very grateful for, the, for those, those traditions. I mean, my wife every year still gets me, get this, an Easter basket. My wife, nice. of course, when, when our kids were small and, uh, you know, even into their teen years, she would make an Easter basket for them. Now, now that our kids are all grown, I get all the candy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought she sold it with IPAs. <laughs> That's right. Well, she could, but, but, but uh, she prefers chocolate. And I'm okay with chocolate. Yeah. Okay. Let's start with eggs. Um, because <laughs> eggs are actually the older tradition. Now, Eggs were used as a symbol of Christ and actually Christ's resurrection because just like the chick bursts from the eggshell, so Christ bursts from the tomb. However, that's not, even that isn't really why eggs are attached to Easter. It turns out that in the medieval church, in the period from Palm Sunday to Easter, there was a more strict fast and people were not allowed to eat eggs. Huh. Here's the problem. The chickens kept laying. Okay. <laughs> so the, the eggs would accumulate. I've noticed this about chickens. I've had chickens. They don't observe the calendar. Uh, yeah, least, yeah, it's, yeah, they're, 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 they're the, the pagan, chickens are pagan. Um, <laughs> so, so, um, so what do you do with the eggs? Well, first of all, because they were laid during Holy Week, they were considered holy eggs. Interesting. And then in the 13th century, since these were holy eggs, someone got the idea that, well, we could decorate them. I sort of think of this as being like making reliquaries where you decorate the things you're going to hold relics in. Yeah. So in the 13th century, they began decorating the eggs, painting them and that kind of thing. And that's where Easter eggs come from. Notice this is the 13th century. This is centuries after paganism has disappeared from Europe. Right, right. <laughs> so you know, the, the, the source of the Easter egg has nothing really to do with fertility. It has everything to do with fasting. Interesting. Yeah. We got all these leftover eggs. Uh, are, you know, what, what are we going to do with these eggs that, that were laid when we uh, were not eating? So this, this kind of brings up something that I'm interested in exploring, but probably we can't get into it in any way today. But there's just a, when it comes to decorating eggs and Fabergé eggs and just different oh, yeah. kinds of things, there's a lot of beautiful work done in this whole sort of, yeah. I guess, uh, genre, I don't know what you call it, but the, the, when it comes to eggs and what people have done with eggs. Uh, well, especially in the them, orth Orthodox you know, tradition, you really have very, very elaborate, beautiful, uh, it's artwork, even iconography yeah. done. And it yeah. is, there's a whole, uh, they, they prep for it and, uh, and there's a whole right, process. Right. But anyway, I just throw that out there. You're right. Yeah, stuff. well, and the Fabergé eggs, of course, are, are justly famous for this. Yeah, yeah. Um, the the Ukrainian pisanki, the their decorated eggs, the Russian decorated eggs, yeah. uh, all of these. You're right; they're they're genuine artwork. But the reason why that entire tradition started is because these were holy objects. These eggs right. were considered holy because they were laid during Holy Week, and you couldn't eat them anyway. Right. Hmm. right. Interesting. So, Interesting. Yeah. Now, rabbits um, are also an interesting one. It turns out in the Middle Ages, rabbits were occasionally used as a symbol for Christ because oh, really? they were considered, yeah, because they were considered good and innocent and, and so on. What about Bugs um, Bunny? Yeah, well, that was before <laughs> Bugs Bunny. Um, um, 
Yeah, BC before Chuck Jones. <laughs> um, but um, the connection of rabbits and Easter, I haven't been able to figure out exactly why it happened, but I do know when it happened. Okay. It started in the 1600s, 17th century, in some Protestant areas. In Protestant areas? I said, I, Protestant areas. I have no idea why. Yeah, but it's it's not until the 17th century, and once again, we are 800 years past paganism. Right now, rabbits were not associated widely with Easter until the 19th century. The 19th century is when the Easter Bunny really takes off. Hmm. But, now, now, when it was, but, when, but in the 19th century, here's here's my thought: Were people still aware of the association with Christ? Or had no. it kind of okay. That's largely that's largely disappeared. Um, and by then, Easter is it is recognized as a church holiday, but it, but like everything else in the church, it's becoming more secularized. Right, right. Yeah. So I suspect I would have to double check on this, but I would suspect that's where you start seeing chocolate rabbits and things like that beginning to emerge. <laughs> I'd mm -hmm. have to double check, but <laughs> but it, it's worth it's worth considering <clears throat> that. Okay, here we have an, an example, and we could talk about several examples along this line of, uh, say, sec the secular sort of economic sphere saying, okay, here, is, here are the materials that the church has bequeathed us. Let's see if there might be some uh, economic opportunity. <laughs> Oops, sorry about that. Are you okay? <laughs> I'm fine. Lynn's cooking in the kitchen. I have no idea what just happened. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 here we have an example of of somebody taking something from the church, commercializing it, and then later Christians going uh, sort of like uh, coming along or coming behind and saying, "Oh, that belongs to them. It's not ours." rather than doing the hard work of sort of reclaiming uh, our own rightful inheritance. You, you see what I'm getting at? Yeah, and actually, I think it goes even further than that. I think what happens is that we look at our practices. We don't know where they came from. We scratch our heads and say, why do we have eggs associated with Easter? Well, it's spring. That's new life. Oh, wait a minute. That sounds like these old pagan fertility things. Oh, what do we think of when we think of rabbits? They multiply really fast. That must be a fertility thing too. So we look at our present practices and we create what in linguistics would be called a folk etymology. Right. Folk etymology is when you talk about the, this word comes from that, even when it doesn't, just because it sounds like it, it could and you've got a plausible reason from it, even if it's not the real etymology, you can create a folk etymology that sort of explains it, but not really that doesn't actually align with reality. We're doing folk etymologies of our, our Easter practices. It's, it, it's spring, so it's new life, so therefore it must be connected to fertility, and we see that with eggs and rabbits and so on. So we read it backwards without actually paying attention to the chronology, to looking at how this stuff really happened. But, you know, in, in, you know, in, that, in the spirit of that, we assume the worst. Right. We, ass we assume that, the, that, oh, there can be no Christian connection here. Uh, it must be these other things. Well, I don't think it was initially assuming the worst. I think most people, frankly, didn't care if it had pagan origins. It still worked. It was still fun. Let's just do it. Much like people who would celebrate Christmas thinking that it, it sat, warmed over Saturnalia, even though it isn't, they still will celebrate Christmas. They don't think of it as being wrong to do that for the most part, unless you're one of these very strict, hardcore people who say we've got to have just New Testament Christianity. We got to purify the church out of anything, you know, that that comes from the culture or whatever. Curious thing about them is that's not how they do missions work. In right. missions work, they always talk about contextualizing the gospel, but somehow they don't like the idea that the gospel might have been contextualized in our our history. Of course, in these cases, it really wasn't. Yeah. Well, I think what you have, I mean, you already have in the New Testament where Gentiles are starting to be converted into the church and you have Peter not knowing what to do. Do I sit with them or do I stay over here? Do I do I continue to be culturally tied to, you know, Judaism 
Um, or is there, you know, can I sit with these pagans who are going to do things different? Then you have meat sacrifice the idols, you know, and then you have the church kind of c- coming up with a middle ground in the council of Jerusalem saying, well, wait a minute, let's, you know, avoid these things. But on the other hand, basically, we're not going to plant the culture of Judaism onto the, the, the Gentiles. Now, Christianity, of course, is going to, as it enters in, you're going to watch people wrestle the, you know, the old pagan philosophies and the old pagan practices to conformity to Christ, which are going to take things that had continuity and they're going to throw things off that had discontinuity. But once the gods were defanged, all of that culture now belongs to Christ. And so as you have Christendom develop, they weren't thinking, oh, there's a rabbit over there that used to be associated with all these things. No, they now aso- associated themselves with being Christian, and they just interpret it in light of their own cultural practice and all of the different histories tied to it. It it wasn't the way we are, where we think we somehow can stand back pure and not uh, not be contaminated by creaturely things that happen to have a, 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 a history wider than just our narrow conversion to Christianity. Right. Yeah. So we we work on being more pure than the people that we're trying to convert. It's okay for them if they adapt their cultural or we present the gospel in terms of uh, cultural images that are relevant for them. But heaven knows we should never have done that. Well, I I think, again, it gets us to this sort of strange, uh, I guess, uh, parallel with wokeism. It's, Mm -hmm. It's as though, you know, the West never did anything right. There was nothing uh, redeemable in Western uh, sort of the, in, in Western and you know the Western world in antiquity. Everything had to go. Everything had to be burned to the ground. There was nothing uh, to it that had anything that was worth redeeming, uh, or it sort of reflected in an imperfect way. Um, you know the intelligence of the Creator. Um, in our particular case, uh, it's. And this is, again, this is a, isn't this is an, an, an interesting parallel? Here we have extremely sort of iconoclastic Protestants and iconoclastic woke people. And they want to both, yeah. they both want to do the same thing, completely destroy yeah. the history of the West and return yeah. to some kind of pure ideal uh, or go or to find some pure idea. And, 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 and there have been people who are secular people unbelieving people who have noted this parallel. So sometimes you'll say, you'll, you'll see people who are, you know, uh, in some sense, conservative. Uh, The problem with, uh, you know, this kind of wokeism is, is it's a kind of neo Puritanism. In other Mm. words, making a connection to a kind of radical Protestantism that wants to just burn it all to the ground. Yeah, Richard Rorty, of above all people, who contributed to enough of that, on the other hand, did not like the political correct direction of postmodernity and this kind of wokeism. He saw it as another kind of fundamentalism. Um, he 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 really uh, mm-hmm. and kind of steered away from it there at the end. And uh, but yeah, you have this, you know, and, and I think it's also something that like we 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 keep hinting around at it, but there is this kind of. Gnostic element, if you will, um, this kind of hyper spiritualizing um, that sees no value in anything creaturely um, and creates an oppositional because of the fall and sin. Therefore, anything that has not been um, have a direct Bible verse tied to it um, has to be steeped in the you know something that is unredeemable, um, and, and you know it, it, it's just like. You get to where do you draw the line there? You know, um, you know. I mean, you could. <laughs> I mean, it could. It, you could almost get to where literally you could be anti-civilizational if you took that yeah. to the well, utmost I, I, uh, extreme. Yeah, I made a I made a, a comment the other day, um, uh, and the comment was, "Without common grace, we wouldn't have the Bible." Now, I think that's a brand new idea for certain people, but let's just think about what what that implies or what that is really getting at. First of all, paper. In other words, do we create paper in in obedience to some biblical um, command? You shall create paper. (laughs) No. (laughs) Paper paper is is a product 
of a sort of cultural process that didn't necessarily have obedience to an explicit command in view. <laughs> Think about printing presses. You know, uh, yes, we have uh, the Bible before we have the advent of the printing press, but the printing press makes it possible for us to be a sort of broadly distributed, uh, biblically oriented church. So, you know, before the printing press, it took a lot of work to create a Bible and a lot of money it was invested in, uh, in making sure that a church had a Bible. So that was a major investment. A lot of folks in our churches don't think about these matters at all. Um, but common grace uh, is the reason why we have a printing press. So the fact that you've got in your hand, then just think about language. Was language created explicitly in obedience to a divine command, you shall create languages? Uh, <laughs> or is it just simply something that we see all around us as a result of God's creative activity in terms of making human beings in his image who go about developing languages. And that means that in some sense, languages are capable of communicating divine truths, truths that transcend history, uh, but nevertheless have an exp are expressed through historical means. So common grace gives us languages, gives us paper, gives us printing presses. Uh, these are things that are not directly direct, you know, connected to a divine command or even, or directly connected uh, to, uh, you know, I, I would say that they are in some respects outworkings of the Christian message, but, uh, and related to it. But I think you know what I'm getting at. People have, uh, printing presses, they have language, and they have uh, paper in places where people don't even know Christ yet. So anyway. Well, there are all kinds of creaturely yeah. things that are wider than where Christianity has has fully brought the culmination of the kingdom of God. Um, but it could be more, it could be a lot of things more innocent. And, and I know Glenn's got more to say, but, but, but just think, mm -hmm. for example, you're a family and you're celebrating the resurrection of Christ and Easter culturally in, in a, you know, earlier time of life where everyone around you is at least culturally Christian. Um, for you to find something as cute as a little bunny rabbit and associate that with getting eggs and, and bringing children into the celebration and fun and making a tradition of that does not mean that you're worshiping some fertility god or, <laughs> or you know, bowing down to the fertility symbolism within the egg. It just means these things are a part of creation and they're a part of culture and you utilize them in your carrying out of family and everyday life. It's not always so tainted. <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. it's just, and I think that's what you're talking about, common, the common aspects of existence that, that don't have to always have a prescription for it in order to be okay, and, and you're free in Christ to, to share in and, and participate in. Yep. yep. You know, um, there's there's another dimension to this. We can come back to some of this, I think. But C.S. Lewis had some rather interesting comments to make about um, what he called the good dreams of the pagans. Right. So if we go to um, the Tammuz and Ishtar story, Ishtar also known as Inanna or Astarte, um, what, the, the, what the legend is, is she's a goddess. She's married to a god, Tammuz. Tammuz dies and goes into the underworld. She doesn't know he's there. She waits three days, and he doesn't come back, and she goes to the underworld and finds him, but then she's trapped there. Uh, the gods um, get together and basically get the underworld god to agree to let Tammuz and Ishtar out for six months. And then Tammuz goes back, Ishtar follows them, and the cycle keeps repeating. This is a way of expressing the, the annual cycle of uh, death in winter and rebirth in spring. That's really what the story is about. It's, it's a myth to explain that. Now, what C.S. Lewis says, you know, it, it, if you're familiar with Greek mythology, it's Persephone, or if you like the Roman Proserpina, 
Um, there, there are similar kinds of things you find in, in other cultures. C.S. Lewis was talking about this in Mere Christianity, and he made a comment that um, the way God responded to the ignorance of humanity or to, to um, the loss of hope of humanity, uh, he says, and what did God do? Well, he talks about conscience, but then he says, he sent the human race what I call good dreams. I mean, those queer stories scattered all through the heathen religions about a God who dies and comes to life again, and by his death has somehow given new life to men. This is in Mere Christianity in a, a chapter called The Shocking Alternative. And what he is suggesting here is that God revealed himself most directly to the Jews through scripture. He reveals himself to everyone through nature. He revealed himself most directly to the Jews through scripture. But even pagan mythology contains hints or shadows of Christian truth. So in a lot of ways, the idea that Ishtar is the root of Easter gets it backwards. Easter is what Ishtar was pointing toward in Lewis's reading of this. And this is why it's possible to look at things in pagan religions and see in them an anticipation of the truth of the gospel. Uh, I read an entire book dealing with Yggdrasil, the world tree in Norse mythology, right. and the ways it point it was used by the early Christians or by the Christians in these regions as a way of expressing the truths of the gospel and the end of the old gods. Yeah. And what it demonstrates, of course, is that the creator of the world in some sense has been uh, sit, sort of uh, working with us in a way so as to help us anticipate uh, the desire of the nations, as you like to bring to our attention, Tom, uh, you know, Christ. So as the one who fulfills the, our longings, our hopes, our dreams that that we've we've had. Um, and they have to do with, you know, just sort of drawing on the creative or sort of the sort of the structure of creation. So if we think about the cycles of, of nature and this, you know, particularly in you know, places far removed from the equator where, where we have the seasons, um, yeah. there is a kind of birth and death and birth uh, dynamic that it's impossible to miss. Does that just, is that just meaningless or is that in some yeah. sense um, yeah. a way for the creator to speak to us about our own need for eternal life? Well, take it a step further. I would argue that the diurnal cycle of, of light and darkness, day and night, is itself another one of these things that God has put into the world to give us hints about deeper realities than just sort of the physical. This is, again, something we talked about in an earlier show when we talked about the sacramental nature of the universe. And, and it's it's interesting that what one of the things you have Lewis tap into here, and it, it, this is kind of profound, just as we will talk about creation being, an, you know, analogous to the creator. And so we can use creaturely things to reference the creator in terms of perfections, and we, we don't violate the creator-creature distinction because we know that it is an effect of the creator, the, the visible attests to the invisible. Um, through which it's clearly seen. But here, what you have Lewis Amos saying is that in the in the historical cycle, and remember, when Lewis is writing at a time when history of religions is really taking off, so what you have here is everyone saying basically Christianity is just the uh, development or evolution of these 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 earlier ideas. And Lewis flips it around and says, "Wait a minute, what you have going on here is what you would expect." Um, when, you know, in Christ, you know, myth becomes fact. All this longing, these dreams become reality. But one of the things that's going on here is Lewis is saying that there is basically an analogous system in the cycle of, of life that informs the myths that attest to redemption. So just as creation attests to the creator, so history and culture analogously can refer 
to redemption. And again, just like creation, because of the fall, distorts that, and you need Christ to illumine that natural revelation to see God truly and then get the fuller picture, so you need the gospel and its reality to illumine what was true in these cycles and and help them see that they were a kind of preparation of grace for the gospel to come and uh, be a gospel to the and a light to the Gentiles. Right. Yeah, and and uh, yeah. So what this boils down to, it seems to me, is that the argument is that everything in the creation points to the Creator, yeah, and right. even the in the darkness of human. Uh, ignorance in the darkness of sin and everything else, we are still in a position where there's enough, call it residual light, that even the pagans caught glimpses of the truth. Right. Now, I, I'd like to kind of move this in a, a slightly different direction, if you don't mind, Glenn. If you have other things that you want to get to, I can certainly save my question for another time. Well, th those that 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 pretty well deals with all of the things I wanted to talk about with connection with paganism and Easter. So, yeah, there are a number of other directions we can go here. So, which one's yours? Well, you know, one of the things that sometimes you run into in certain circles is that, um, you know, the Lord's Day is kind of Easter every week. So, why should mm -hmm. we, uh, you know, make a special uh, Easter out of the weekly Easter? <laughs> you, you get what I'm getting at. So. You know, the Lord's Day uh, is observed on the first day of the week because Christ was raised on the first day of the week, as opposed to the Sabbath, which is the last day of the week. So the Christian Sabbath is actually a, an observance of a kind of eighth day. Uh, some of our uh, Orthodox friends are very explicit about that, but it's implied in just the whole concept of the Christian yeah. Sabbath. The eighth day being the day of the new creation. We're right. back to the beginning of the week. That's why the eighth day is so important. Right, right. So this is, of course, why, say, Sabbatarians of the Seventh-day Adventist type uh, criticize the Christian uh, and, you know, practice of the Christian Sabbath, which is the eighth day or the first day, depending on how you want to think about it. Um, but, but because of this, some people uh, will... Uh, make the argument that uh, an annual observance of Easter is in some sense superfluous and maybe even extra biblical or uh, not really something that we should be uh, engaged in or involved with. Yeah, any thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I thought you would. <laughs> um, okay, so, so um, first of all, um, I'll, I'll heighten this up a bit. Since God has commanded celebration on the Sabbath, when you have days other than the Sabbath that you only celebrate annually, those days automatically become more special because they're more rare. And that amounts to being disobedience to God because of the fact that he commanded one, so that one has to be the one that's the most important. To which I say, e, not so fast. When you take a look at scripture, you will never find an explicit command to celebrate in the Old Testament. You'll never find a command to celebrate the Feast of Dedication. We call that Hanukkah. Great. And yet in the Gospel of John, you see Jesus celebrating the Feast of Dedication. Great. So if you take a strict reading of the regulative principle, Jesus violated it. And therefore, well, we've got problems with our salvation. Great. Right. Right. Okay. So not... So fast. Right. It turned, uh, Purim was never commanded. And yet it's described, and they, they, they talk about the fact that Purim was a, uh, you know, a commemoration of the salvation of the Jews then. But nowhere was it commanded. God never told them to celebrate that. Right. It's described, but not commanded. It turns out that the pattern that you see in Scripture is that whenever God does a great act of redemption in history— it gets commemorated. That is what scripture, when you look at the pattern of the Old Testament, pattern of Jewish worship, that's the conclusion you reach. Was there a greater act of redemption for God's people than Good Friday and Easter? Answer, no. 
So I don't think it is violating, it may be violating a letter of scripture, but then again, if you take the regulative principle, the hard version of the regulative principle, but then again, you'd have to accuse Jesus of doing the same thing. I think that it is fully in keeping with the tenor of scripture and the way God works throughout history to have days like Easter that we use to commemorate the great acts of God in history. So that's, that's number one. Number two, when uh, we attended an Orthodox Presbyterian church, the OPC, only perfect church, as they told me, um, <laughs> when, when, when we attended this church in, um, in Maryland, um, Lynn grew up in the Lutheran church, and they, they really do big things for Easter. And we came to church on Easter, and to quote Lynn, they didn't even have a lily. <laughs> it was just a Sunday like any other Sunday. And the pastor got up and said, isn't it great that we don't have to make a great big deal about Easter because every Sunday is a resurrection Sunday for us. <sighs> then October came around and they had this big push for the Reformation Day rally. <laughs> I asked them which was more fundamental to the faith, Luther nailing the 95 theses to the church door or Easter. You know, <laughs> why do we make a big deal of this and not that? And um, the, to his credit, the elder listened to this argument and said, because we're inconsistent. <laughs> and the next year they celebrated Easter. Oh, interesting. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I'll give him. I'll give him credit. Once it was pointed out to him, they said, "Yeah, you know what? This isn't really right," and they fixed it. So, yeah, th th those are some semi-random thoughts on your question. <laughs> one of the thoughts that comes to my mind, or one of the one of the responses that comes to to mind for me, has to do with the fact that nature hates a vacuum. And what I mean by that is that mm -hmm. there are an, there is an annual cycle. We call it the year. And if we don't uh, use that annual cycle to mark time in a way that acknowledges sal our salvation and, the, and how the creator uh, who made that annual cycle is the same creator who saves us, then there's something else that's going to fill in the space. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. If we abandon the year, the cycle of the year, there's going to be something else that fills the gap. So um, that's, I think, a pretty significant thing to note because it's just a fact. When we got rid of a lot of Christian uh, feast days, what happened? The state fills the, the space with, with, you know, holidays, some of them are just fine. I don't have anything against the 4th of July. Uh, I don't have anything against even Thanksgiving because I think Thanksgiving is in one of those odd quasi holidays that kind of uh, makes it possible for everybody to participate at the same time. It, some, it sort of begs a question, which God are we talking about here to be grateful to, <laughs> you know, even though it's a, you know, state holiday. Yeah, well, we see now that, you know, the celebration of the self, right, the empowered self. Now we have this history month or this, you know, marginalized group uh, movie month. And I mean, it's like every day, new saints of this new kind of woke religion. Um, so, so, yeah, we, we really do. We, we have this stuff. And, and I think one of the things you see very early in Christianity is the, the worship liturgy was not jettisoned down to the, the most minimal. It showed the places in which Christ fulfilled the, uh, the liturgical cycle of Judaism. And so you see, especially if somebody who's done Passover with, with Easter, uh, you, you, you really capture the fulfillment of so much of what the Old Testament supplies um, for a Christian, and it keeps us in contact with with that. It, it prevents us from ripping it in in an in a Gnostic or heretical way from its its roots in in uh, you know the people of Israel. So so there is a place here for that tradition to show its fulfillment, but to help inform as Christianity moves into the Gentile world, still from that foundational revelation and source. 
So I think keeping those things, um, one of the things I remember when, when I was in Oxford, I was living in the house with the, the Orthodox at, um, church because they helped, um, especially theology students, have a room to stay. Well, I went with some friends and actually went right around Passover to visit a, a synagogue in the service. Then the next uh, day was e- the Orthodox Easter, or well, the, very close, close by. And one of the things that struck me is how similar their liturgies were except for one was off to the side reading in Hebrew, one's off to the side reading in Greek. But then how, how those distinctions show their fulfillment when on Easter they come out, the, the, you know, the veil has been torn, the gospel comes out. I mean, you really saw in liturgical um, enactment all that we talk about in, in biblical um, language. And it was, it was really something for someone like myself who comes from such Protestant background to where that stuff has been just removed and seen as nothing but kind of embellishment and insignificant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. One thing I would also add is that the church year, and again, this is getting a little bit off topic, but the church year is a way of showing that time is sacred as well. You know, that, that, Every, you know, I, I would argue that we really need to recover a sacramental vision of the world. But at the very least, we need to recognize that time itself, as, as a good creation of God, is something that is sacred and that needs to, be, needs to be sanctified. It needs to be set apart for him. And the church year is an effective way, I think, of uh, helping us do that. And again, it, you know, it follows the pattern of God in the Old Testament, you know, we don't need to celebrate the Old Testament feasts. They've been fulfilled in Christ. But God still saw fit to set up commemorations of key events in history and to link them through the, the, the year to agricultural cycles, seasonal cycles, and things like that. So as a way of marking time and sanctifying time, I think that these kinds of things are, are good and important thing for us to be doing. You know, related to the agricultural cycle, and this is something I've never heard uh, brought up, um, is the fact that in the Southern Hemisphere, they're reversed, but the dates are still the same. So in other words, we are in spring in the Northern Hemisphere right now. Well, it's the fall in the Southern Hemisphere, (laughs) yet they're still observing Easter. Now, I'm not making, I'm not trying to make an argument that we should have different dates. I'm just noting that this is an interesting matter that's never seemed to have uh, become a controversy. I hope it doesn't. I hope I'm not the first to create one. (laughs) Yeah. Considering that, uh, according to the Catholic Church, Easter is the first full moon Excuse me, the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. Okay. <laughs> um, that poses, that, that does pose an interesting problem canonically uh, for the Catholic Church in the Southern Hemisphere. Because our spring equinox is not the same as our spring equinox. <laughs> I, I don't think I'm going to take that up with the canon lawyer. Though. <laughs> but I'm, I'm glad that it hasn't been brought up. But I'm just surprised that it hasn't been brought up. You know, we talk about, you know, Eurocentrism and, and you know, all of the biases and stuff like that, that people love to uh, dredge up to argue about. But no one from the South, you know, in Africa, for example, or in South America has taken upon themselves or even Australia to get all worked up about this, they they've they've accepted the the cycle that we have and and s- just kind of work with it. I could see an Aussie doing it just to cause trouble, <laughs> <laughs> but that's it, uh, just just to cause trouble. <laughs> and for our listeners in Australia, yeah, y- yeah, I yeah. Please don't. (laughs) We have enough problems. (laughs) That's right. Well, it's it's actually what I like about Australians, to be honest. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, they're they're generally a pretty ornery group, and that's one of the things I agree I like about them. But this whole COVID stuff, they they got very compliant, at least many of them, and I was a little disappointed. But anyway, uh, that's a whole different subject for another day. Anyway, thank you for listening to the Theology Podcast. We've come to the point in the show where we kind of wrap things up. 
is there anything you want to say as we do that, uh, Tom? No, I'm good. I think we covered anything anything on my mind at the moment. <laughs> anything else you have to say there, uh, Glenn? Yeah, if you're in one of the traditions that has a hard time with Easter, lighten up and enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> have, have a bu- have a chocolate bunny. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, dark chocolate. <laughs> You can even well, dress like a bunny. You can even get the outfit if you're really into it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, well, let, let me note one other thing. Okay. There are some traditions, there are some monasteries specifically in Europe that during the 40-day Lenten fast do nothing but drink beer. No food. <laughs> they just do a beer fast. So I think that, that's, that now they have a special beer that's got a little more oomph to it. Okay. Um, <laughs> calorically and things like that. But even still, um, I, I think that might also be a tradition worth reestablishing. <laughs> I'm, all, I'm with you. I'm with you there, Glenn. Good idea. <laughs> well, thank you for listening to the Theology Podcast. We really do appreciate your support and your interest in the show. Uh, if you uh, have access to you know, a uh, podcasting platform and you'd like to uh, rate us with a five-star rating or five, whatever. We'd really appreciate that. If you don't like the show, why did you listen so long? And uh, why (laughs) go to the trouble of actually giving us a negative review? Uh, If you have uh, an interest in supporting the show, there are ways to do that. And we have a number of people who do, and we appreciate them. There are people who support us through the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network. There are people who support us through various podcasting platforms uh, because they make those available. And then there are people who support us through direct giving and uh, they go to the trouble of actually going to our website and and giving us funds and those are all uh, great ways to support the show there are costs and uh, and and all of the funds that you uh, provide to us go to address those costs none of the funds go to Tom or Glenn or me Uh, they go to the cost of the show and uh, we're grateful that you do that anyway Thanks a lot and bye-bye.